to Denver virtually. I um, I really wish it was in person and that I was getting to um, spend time with each of you. Nick and I are delighted to be here and talk about impact investing at Intermountain. And this is a, a really special and surreal kind of experience to see so many people joining the meeting who are a part of SCL Health. And I've seen Peggy and Katie and Chuck and Gay and Sam and April and Patrice. And I've never met any of you um, in in uh, in person yet, or even in a in a call like this, so it's a little bit surreal. Um, for those of you who don't know, we'll be Intermountain Healthcare is merging with SCL Health, and we have a target close of April first. So, um, everything that Nick and I are going to be talking about today is really speaking to uh, what Intermountain Healthcare is involved in today. And uh, know that we're really excited to get to know Denver and uh, and also the broader areas of Colorado and Montana and Kansas as we um, as we get to know our SCL health friends. And certainly hope that we discover some aspect of addressing the social determinants of health through impact investing together. Um, but that is way off in our future conversations. So today we're going to focus on um, kind of level setting around how we approach impact investing at Intermountain. Um, I'll do that level setting and then Nick will get into the nuts and bolts of what does that really mean and what are we doing and how are we doing it. And then, um, and then I'm going to come back and kind of give you a little bit of insight into our journey, um, you know, how we got there, how long it took us to get there, et cetera. And then we really want to open it up to questions. And in fact, Nick and I are both really comfortable with questions as we go. Uh, so certainly put them in the chat. But also, if you want to interject before we move on, just um, raise your hand or, or come off mute. We're comfortable with that as well. And we, we certainly intend to uh, make this a dialogue. So um, let's go ahead and get started. So impact investing for us um, at Intermountain is really about um, thinking about this. Hey, Siri, call Veronica Brella. Oh, I think we're hearing someone. We, anything we need to stop for, Michelle? I don't think so, okay. No. Great, then let's go ahead to the next slide. So just level setting, what is an impact investment? Um, different people might mean different things by this terminology, but what we mean in Intermountain Healthcare is, some, is an investment that addresses a social determinant of health. And we'll get into how we've defined that at Intermountain. And it earns a modest financial return. It has to do, that, has to do both. And it does that for low and moderate income people specifically and always within Intermountain Service Area. So today that's Utah, Southern Idaho, and Southern Nevada. And um, we, we really look for all of these factors. And in fact, this is, you know, in thinking about whom we invest with, we have to be really careful that the investment uh, channels to these geographic areas, that it channels to and low and moderate income people, even if we have to break down a specific investment. So that's a, a big driver of, um, and what makes it hard in some ways to find these investments and, and take some time. Next slide. So for us, we really apply this in this way. Um, we have to impact a community health priority. Uh, we identify our priorities, our system-wide community health priorities today um, of improving mental health and well-being, avoidable disease and injury, or improving air quality. And social determinants of health contribute to all of these health priorities. So it's fairly easy if we're focusing on the social determinants of health to do that. Um, Intermountain defines the social determinants of health using common um, definitions, uh, but we really think about those areas that are primary determinants of health as being those most important to impact um, through our impact investment work. So interpersonal violence, food insecurity, utility, housing instability, transportation, um, as well as then those other areas, education, income, employment, et cetera, and you'll see how that plays out. We have to support local economic development and focus on communities who um, are, are marginalized in some way, have low employment rates, lower moderate income, and disparities in their overall health status or specific health outcomes. And so as we've applied this to our work and, and gotten started, we've ended up focusing in primarily in two areas. 
um, we are, if we go to the next slide, really concentrating on housing instability and income and employment. Um, these focus areas have surfaced out of our other community health work, frankly, as the areas of highest need with the potential to be impacted through impact investment. There's a clear role that we can play um, here and have an impact on, on the other work. That doesn't mean that we're not interested in addressing the other social determinants of health. In fact, we've been looking pretty earnestly for an opportunity to invest in nutrition security. Um, I'm still optimistic we're going to find it, uh, but we haven't yet. And so those other determinants of health are, uh, I'd say, equally of interest, but it seems like the need is very great in these two and the opportunities for investment are tangible and, um, and we've been successful finding them. So with that, I'm going to transition to Nick to talk about how we're applying that in Housing First. Go ahead, Nick. Thank you so much, Mikkel. Um and uh, your, your nudge was noted there, Mikkel. We're gonna find something to do in food insecurity, I promise. We just have to, we have to find the right thing. Well, um, and now we said that in Denver where Michelle holds us accountable to do what good. we say. So. Well, Michelle, I'll be that. expecting your call. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thanks so much, Mikkel, and, and thanks everybody. Um, uh, I wanna talk through, whoops, I clicked off my screen. So I wanna just talk through the kind of what of what we're doing. Um, and I'll, I'll address a bit on the slide, but I wanna use these to talk about some examples of what we've done, because I think that's kind of most illustrative. Um, so as, as you know, you may have gathered from what Mikkel was saying, from an investment lens, once you, once you put all of these screens on, you know, the, the universe of sort of things that you can invest in, you know, it has to be uh, geographically specific. It has to address the social determinant of health. It has to benefit a low-income community. Um, th that universe of things gets really very small. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we um, uh, did early on in our, our impact investing work, and we've been at this for about two and a half years, right? We're still very new. Um, and, and, you know, I don't think we claim to have the, the answers on any of this, but um, we develop the ability to, to originate loans. So we do direct lending as a pretty large portion of our portfolio. Um, you know, we, uh, one key concept that uh, Mikkel kind of implied as she was um, talking through those two areas of focus that we have is this concept of additionality. Uh, so, you know, it, when we were looking at, you know, the, the whole universe of social determinants and all of the things that we could focus on, um, housing instability and uh, financial wellness were two areas where we thought, hey, you know, we can we can have some additionality there, right? Or another way to think of that is, you know, we we might be able to offer some financial products, be they loans or something else, uh, in the marketplace that uh, either are very scarce or don't exist. And um, as a result of our willingness to do that, we might be able to you know help increase uh, the the affordable housing units or, um, you know, ha have an impact broadly. So the, the one area where that has, um, has, you know, really sort of borne out for us is in housing instability. So um, this is uh, sort of the, the area that we focused most on. Um, almost all of our work to date has been in housing instability. I think uh, probably 80% by dollars has been sort of in this issue area. Um, so anyway, sorry, I sort of did that in reverse order. Um, so the, the direct lending work we're doing here uh, is, um, you know, typically to uh, nonprofit developers, although not necessarily. Um, and importantly, and one of the things that <clears throat> we were really intentional about is we didn't want to compete with banks or other folks who were doing lending, right? Because we aren't a lender, we're a health system, so we're not particularly good at it, um, nor do we want to sort of make our potential partners mad in the areas that we're working. So um, we've uh, developed these loans that uh, oftentimes are a second to a bank product, so we're behind a bank. Um, and our additionality here is is really that we can we can write repayment terms that banks just can't. Um, so we can have really extended amortization or you know interest only or or sort of pure interest 
um, or, or uh, even deferred payment um, loans. And the, the way we think about underwriting these is, you know, one, uh, like a bank, do we think we have a reasonably high likelihood of uh, getting our, our dollars back at least? Um, but also we structure the repayment to, to meet the needs of the project, not the other way around. So, you know, often we'll, uh, a good example of this is uh, with the, the Utah Housing Preservation Fund, which is kind of one of our flagship um, things that we've, we've participated in. So we've done a couple of direct loans with the Preservation Fund. The Preservation Fund exists to just preserve naturally occurring affordable housing in Utah. So nonprofit owner and operator. Um, but the challenge with the preserving affordable housing is in this market, you have to be willing to pay a sort of market price and then only charge way submarket rents. Um, so the economics of these projects are really hard. And what we said to the, the fund is, hey, you know, you tell us um, kind of what the economics of the project are after the bank loan, right? How much cash flow do you have every month to, to uh, play with? And then we'll structure our terms to sort of work with that. Um, so a, that's one example of sort of how we've done a direct loan. You know, we've we've done other uh, types of direct loans uh, where you know we might be the primary. Um, and you know, the, an example of one of those we just closed in the last two weeks uh, is with a homeless services provider in St. George, Utah, um, and that is uh, and. They, they wanted to acquire a motel to turn into transitional housing. Um, and we, we helped them to do that. And obviously, you know, the, the economics of that are thin as well. So we tend to work best when uh, the project kind of, but for our participation might not work. Um, those are the projects that we really love to participate in. Um, on, the, on the fund side, you know, kind of moving away from direct loans, one of the strategies that many of our peers across the country uh, uh, have really utilized is investing through CDFIs and other sort of mission-based intermediaries. We have the challenge in Utah of having very few CDFIs based in Utah. Um, when we started this work, we had four. In the meantime, we went down to three. And I think this year we've come back up to five. Um, and only two or three are really active and working in the areas that we're interested in. So, you know, we, there just wasn't a lot of this opportunity right out of the gate. But we are working with um, you know, the, uh, some CDFIs and CDCs, um, and some just investment funds that are place-based, um, to invest sort of through this intermediary structure. I'm going to move on to, um, income and employment. And please, if, if I'm uh, a little too deep or not going deep enough in terms of details, let me know. Um, but otherwise, I'll just uh, kind of keep going along the same line. So, Nick, I wanted to ask you: have, yeah. Are you going to share in a bit about how much money you've actually put into the direct loans? And yes. Okay. Yes, I will. Thank you. So the other issue area that we're focused on is income and employment, and we, we've done less of this work. Um, but the the two kind of strategies there that we think about are one financial inclusion. So we'd like to be able to fund organizations and products that are, um, you know, providing a, a, a financial product to LMI communities who may not otherwise have access. Um, and we want to do kind of traditional, quote unquote, economic development, right? You saw it in our guiding principles. Um, we're sort of of the mind that if you can uh, help to improve employment prospects and, and provide some pressure to increase wages, um, and also just give small businesses the, the capital they might need to grow, um, but you can really affect health in a meaningful way. Um, this work, is, we've done a lot less of this work. You know, I mentioned we are 80% housing, about 20% um, sort of things we bucket in the income and employment section. Um, our economic development work uh, to be totally transparent is, is pretty much aspirational at this point. We have a handful of projects kind of in the pipeline that we're looking at. Um, we have done some financial inclusion work largely through some down payment assistance projects. Um, one example that I would talk through, uh, you know, it, it, here is a group called the Rocky Mountain Homes Fund. So this was a, a small little startup fund who, when we started with them, when we were the, the anchor investor, they were in one county. 
Um, and we, we invested a million dollars, you know, their, their mission is, um, they are, are doing down payment assistance for LMI families in the county that, that they're based in. So, um, they, they basically buy, buy the home for the person and then, uh, structure it through a trust, uh, to sort of, um, uh, you know, take down a significant portion of the equity of that home for the home buyer until such a time as they can kind of refinance them out. It's a, it's a bit of a complex model that I don't know that we need to get into here, but um, you know, the bottom line was for us, uh, there was a lot of additionality because this was, you know, being so young, this kind of fund uh, was, was going to have a hard time attracting institutional investors. Um, and also it was directly benefiting folks working in the service community in, in the county in Weber County. Um, so these were teachers and healthcare workers were sort of the two areas that um, areas of employees that the fund was targeting. And that's really the, you know, in terms of the type of investment we would do to support income and employment, they would mostly be something like that, right? Where we're looking at intermediary investments. I mean, Intermountain doesn't want to be in a position of doing direct personal lending or even doing direct to, to small business lending for a lot of reasons that I'm happy to get into if it's helpful. Um, but we see this as, uh, you know, that this strategy is being largely supported by this kind of intermediary, you know, investment fund type structure. So. Nick, before you go on to this part, there's a couple of questions in the chat that I oh, think would you. be great for you to address at this point. Um, Katie Tiernan Johnson's asking, how do we identify partners to choose our community investments? Um, what kinds of things are we looking for? And then Kevin Hernandez has asked if we've provided loans to community land trusts in the past. So the second question is easier to answer. Uh, so I'll do that first. Um, no, we haven't, but we would love to. I mean, there's a couple of land trusts in Utah that, that we know of. Um, I oftentimes, um, it, it can be challenging to find organizations who are sort of after our, our type of debt, right? That we can provide. Um, partially because there aren't a lot of other providers of it, right? So it's not really a product that folks have baked into their model. Um, but yeah, we'd love to work with a land trust. Um, and on the identifying partners, you know, it's, it's a challenge. I think one of the key things is a commitment to, to impact, right? A commitment to the mission. Um, so we have to be really confident that post-investment, it's easy for, for folks to talk a big game pre-investment, but post-investment, um, our partners will sort of do right by us and, um, you know, invest in such a way as, as uh, we envisioned. So, you know, that that uh, is a pretty easy hurdle for your average kind of nonprofit working in the community to make um, or to, to uh, you know, um, to meet. Um, so, you know, our uh, nonprofit affordable housing developers, um, various service providers, particularly where real estate is a big component of their kind of model. Um, those partners work great for us. Uh, we, we don't have to invest with nonprofits. We can invest with for-profits, but, you know, we have to have a really clear um, understanding of uh, how this, you know, how the investment will benefit LMI communities in the end and not be extractive in some way. So a, a good way to, a, an example of that, um, this is a project that we're working on right now. Um, it's kind of in its late stages, but a, a developer who is for-profit, but does a fair amount of affordable housing um, in the community. Um, they approached us and said, hey, you know, we, we, we'd really like to do a, a sort of tax credit bridge loan. Um, you know, it's kind of the only way the project works. And we said, okay, that's great, but you have to provide a certain level of services on site um, in order for us to participate. And we're still going through some of that negotiation in terms of what that is, but you know, that was a, a mechanism for us to sort of ensure that um, it would be a, a high impact, um, a high impact development. I might just add, Nick, that um, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit of as we close about how we got here. And what you'll notice as Nick talks is, is he's a very um, well-educated investor. He really ex has great understanding for looking for that investment component. You pair that up with um, community health 
mm-hmm. individuals who know community and pretty much anyone who is a partner in our community health work has the potential to be benefited by our impact investing in the right project. Um, but there haven't been too many of those because it's not often that a nonprofit partner is at that inflection point of growth or um, looking for investment. But that has been a, you know, I, I think we come at this kind of from two ends. Where are those investment opportunities on the development side? And then what are the growth needs of um, of nonprofits that are already partnered in the work? Absolutely, yeah. And, and one thing I neglected to mention um, on our housing work, you know, when we think about the direct lending, this is real estate lending. Um, I mean, we're, we're not doing uh, any other kind of asset-based lending like you might to a small business or somebody who just doesn't have, um, you know, real estate uh, assets to, to offer as collateral. Um, so this works really well for folks who are expanding, buying buildings, um, in some cases, building buildings. Um, it works less well for folks who are just kind of looking for working capital or some other type of, um, of loan. So I'll advance and put some numbers to the thing. So to date, um, this is the slide is a tiny bit outdated. I apologize. Today, we're a, a little bit more than $50 million committed. Um, that's not all deployed, but it's mostly deployed. Um, I think we have, you can see down here about, well, 31 deployed. That number is a little higher now. Um, and this is, we have a, um, a sort of target portfolio size that we're aiming for. It floats based on a percentage of our investable assets, but um, that number right now that we're aiming for is about 190 millions. We'll see this as sort of totally allocated at around, you know, just south of um, $200 million. So we're a good chunk of the way there. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, if you look right below our sort of allocation total market value, um, there's a, 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 we're kind of across asset classes. So we have a fair amount of direct loans um, that will continue to be a pretty uh, healthy portion of the portfolio in the future. Um, although that we're, we're kind of wringing our hands a bit at the moment, or at least I am uh, wringing my hands a bit at the moment, um, just about the sort of servicing that's required there. Um, so we have largely done that internally to date, um, but at some point, you know, we may think about is a loan servicer appropriate. Um, and then the rest are more traditional asset classes for an institutional investor, right? So we have um, some private credit and some, fi- some public fixed income that are um, vehicles that allowed for geographic and issue area targeting, which is exceptionally rare. Um, but we found a couple. And then uh, we have a right now a pretty large chunk of kind of private equity real estate is the closest thing we can classify it as. But, you know, these are things that um, like the uh, down payment assistance funds fall into this group because in, in theory it is, you know, private equity technically, but it doesn't kind of come with the, the private equity baggage, right? I think folks say private equity and they just, just you know, assume huge returns and, and sort of a primarily financial motivation. It's really not what we're doing here. We Maybe we ought to rethink about how to say that. Um, and then just in terms of deployment, you know, that um, this just kind of shows over time how we've done. So we started in 2019. Our first uh, investment on December 31st of that year was $5 million um, into one of these, uh, the private, I think that was the, the public fixed income vehicle that we found. Um, and then, uh, you know, all the way up to 2021, where uh, we were able to commit uh, a little over $30 million last year, um, which we're, we're super happy with. And then on the, uh, just a note on, on impact performance metrics. So the kind of highest level number that we count here, this is more of a sort of output than an outcome, um, but we're counting a, a number of housing units that we have supported in some way and the number of folks benefited from one of our kind of financial wellness investments. Um, so the way to read this is in 2021, um, you know, our investments or loans uh, supported the, the construction or preservation of 567 units of housing. Um, we define affordable housing as the, the sort of strict definition is less than 80% AMI. Um, I forget what the average in our portfolio is at the moment, but it's significantly lower than that. We're kind of aiming for 50% AMI 
Um, it doesn't work with every project, but that's sort of what we aim for. Um, and then the way to read the financial wellness metric is exactly that 188 people have been benefited by um, a financial wellness product. So as an example, uh, you know, if, if a family of five um, was able to buy a home because of one of the down payment assistance uh, products, um, that would count as five here. And in total, um, over time, um, we've done a little over a thousand units that we've supported. Um, now, in, an important note here too, in many of those, you know, we're not the only money in the deal. Um, so for deals that we have really high additionality, we count kind of every unit, right? Um, but for our participation, this wouldn't really work. So we'll count every unit. And those that we maybe have a little bit less additionality where like, yes, we have some, but we, you know, I don't know that we can make an argument that, but for us, it wouldn't exist. Um, we count a sort of proportional number of units. Um, and one thing that's that notably absent here is financial performance. Um, I, I, I'll share kind of what we aim for. So, you know, in terms of benchmark, um, we're, we use the, the three-year trailing CPI as sort of our target. Uh, so when we're pricing loans, um, we, we actually don't price them based on CPI. We price them based on the um, Federal Home Loan Bank um, advance uh, rates for, for sort of the, an equal time in that uh, loan. Um, but we're writing, you know, three, three and a half percent loans, sometimes a little less. Um, that's kind of on the high end at the moment. And our, you know, our fund products performance varies quite a bit. We only have a handful, right? So they varies quite a bit, even month to month at the moment. Um, but those are on average kind of, you know, returning five, six percent. So we're coming in right around um, that three-year CPI number in terms of our sort of blended return. And, the, you know, the when we wrote our policy on this, um, our impact investing policy, we noted three-year CPI as kind of the, the target just to maintain purchasing power. Um, we're think, rethinking that a little bit now based on what inflation has done in the last year. It's starting to seem like a, a really high target, even if it's, you know, looking at three years back. Um, so we're, we're kind of thinking about whether that's still appropriate or not, but that's what we've used today. And then finally, I don't, I don't want to spend a ton of time here, but I wanted to just have the slide here if we wanted to talk about it. Um, we are pretty intentional about our impact measurement. We use this framework. This is not ours. This is um, the Global Impact Investing Network's IRIS Plus framework. So these are all borrowed from them. Um, this is open source. You can all go create an IRIS Plus account and generate you know, sort of one of these for yourself. Um, but we, you know, ultimately it kind of breaks down into answering questions about what is the core outcome that we're interested in. So for housing, it's retention rate. That's kind of the outcome that's tied to health outcomes. Um, for financial inclusion, the, the sort of best thing we have is just a number of jobs created and maintained. Um, and then for employment support, it's a, a number of client transactions. But then when you go deeper than that, you know, a lot of the sort of um, devil is in the details here where, you know, it matters a lot. Uh, for instance, in housing, um, what the affordability level is, right? Who is living there and how much are they making? Um, it matters a lot what the eviction rate is. Uh, one thing that's not on here that we've asked some folks for is sort of percentage of positive exits, right? So taking folks out of the eviction rate that moved into their own sort of, you know, non-financial supported home. Um, are there other uh, kind of non-financial support services offered? Um, so when we, you know, we, we collect this, we have a sort of worksheet every year that we send out in particular to our um, borrowers, but also to, to our funds. Um, we, we try to tell the story of uh, all these things, right? What outcomes did we affect? For whom? How, how do we know they're working? How much of each outcome did we create? Um, and then sometimes we ask for, this is a sort of experimental one. Most folks don't ask for satisfaction rate, but we're kind of starting to uh, um, pressure borrowers to, to maybe have a client feedback system of some type. Many already do, um, but this is one that we're experimenting with. I don't know that we'll have a lot of data on it, but this is kind of how we think about impact measurement. 
beyond just a number of units and a number of people benefited. Um, and I, that's kind of it for mine. Um, I'm going to turn back over to Mikkel. So that's kind of you know what we're doing. Um, and then Mikkel's going to talk a little bit about how we got there. Sorry, I know, Michelle, I'm, we're talking a lot longer than I said we would. It's all good. It's all good. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, well, um, and, and there was a question from Chuck Alt in the chat regarding health metrics for housing, and I think we answered it, but if we want to come back and talk about that further, I think um, the last slide that Nick went over answered that, but happy to revisit details there, Chuck. That was so, perfect, thank you. Okay, good. Um, so uh, just want to now talk a little bit about how we got here, because, um, you know, Nick probably is making it look simple. We've got $50 million invested and um, it, it took us some time to get to this space and we still have quite a bit of growth to do. But, um, you know, the, I think the thing that uh, maybe Nick didn't mention on that chart, each of those little red lines was entry target and stretch goals for where our investment deployments would be at each year. And he's He's nailed every single one of them and kind of really overshot it this last year. So we're moving faster than we thought we would. Um, and that's kind of been the case at every step of this journey, um, which is really interesting, except for the very beginning. I think the first time that I heard about impact investing was probably about 2014. And uh, it's hard for me to place exactly how the context in which I heard about it. I'm, I'm pretty sure Kaiser was talking a little bit about it um, and a few of the large Catholic health systems. And as I talked with our chief treasury officer at the time, she was really intrigued by the concept and, and we researched it together. We took it forward to our CFO at some point there. I, I don't know the exact timing and, and um, you know, I could tell it just didn't really resonate for him. To him, it sounded like a grant. Um, it, it did not sound like an investment vehicle. We then heard about um, some of the work actually that we hired Nick away from at the Sorensen Impact Center that was uh, really pay for success types of models. And, and we, we approached our finance team about making some investments in those pay for success models. Again, it ultimately, the answer was that's a grant, Mikkel. You've got grant dollars to work with. If, um, if you really think that that's where we should go, then you know, let's think about it from that perspective, but we're not ex we can't expect a payback. So we joined the um, Healthcare Anchor Network in 2017, and this really gave us for the first time the opportunity to connect our Chief Treasury Officer with um, Chief Treasury Officers from other health systems that were doing the same thing, to use the playbook materials that they developed to really educate ourselves in the words of um, those we were trying to influence. And, um, and that was a turning point. We were able to talk not just about impact investing, but also about um, our local spend and local purchasing practices, as well as our hiring and you know, pipeline creation opportunities for addressing the social determinants of health. And at the same time, we were really beginning to invest directly in the social determinants of health for our patients and our members, and also thinking about how we could influence it at a population or a community level. So this fit very much with the strategy of the organization, as well as we now had a tool to communicate well. So um, we began to accelerate pretty quickly from that point forward. Um, we joined in the summer of 2017, by, um, by about the first of the year of 2018, we had a game plan. We had buy-in from um, C-level, uh, C-suite level uh, leaders. And at that point, I wasn't yet in the C-suite. Um, I was a, a vice president of community health at that time. But with finance partners and others, we uh, got the CEO and the CFO really on board. And received agreement to invite a group of people to our impact or excuse me, our investment committee retreat that occurs once a year every spring. And in that retreat, we brought in um, guests from Kaiser, Bon Secours and Wellstar who had all who were all at different stages of impact investment. Some had been doing it for a long time. 
um, and others were uh, were just beginning and didn't yet have the proof points or the kind of all the safety experiences that we knew our investment committee would wonder about. And our goal with that meeting was just to bring these speakers and talk about it and then to come back in subsequent meetings with an actual proposal for what we would do at Inner Mountain. And it rapidly um, transitioned from them sharing to our investment committee talking about what they wanted to do. And they proposed actually a 5% of, uh, they proposed 5% of the portfolio go towards impact investing. And we then found ourselves in the position of talking them back to 2%, which is where we wanted to land in a future meeting. And so by summer, we had, um, we had approved investment committee policies and guiding principles. Um, and, and our policy allows for 2% of the uh, total investment portfolio for the operation side. It doesn't include our health plan or um, foundation assets, but our operations portfolio are uh, approved in the, and that's our intent to be investing up to that level. We're not there yet. Um, it took us about a year then to get um, some key work in place, um, post a position around um, impact investing. And we had um, the, the greatest find ever in Nick Fritz. He has um, been everything we imagined. And I wanna comment that between that time when we were really talking about how do we organize this work, I'll show you the governance structure and how we do this. Uh, we had a lot of debate about whether the impact investing director was a member of the community health team or whether they were a member of the treasury and finance team. And we went back and forth multiple times. Um, ultimately landed on this position being based in the treasury department and sitting on the community health leadership team, which is a team I convene, but it includes, and it includes the entire community health team in Intermountain and a lot of other people who are uh, like Nick, supportive and, and important to the work, but have an important expertise and home department, if you will, that adds um, great assets to the work. As soon as Nick was in place, he began the work, set goals, uh, created the paperwork and process for this, and committed to closing our first investment before the end of the year, and he did it, of course. Um, so let's go to the, the last slide here, which really just shows the governance. Um, our process, uh, we, were, we were really intentional. This took us several months to get in place, um, but the idea we wanted that was we wanted our community health team, our finance team, and our treasury team to work together in support of our impact investing director in guiding this work. So Nick identifies the potential projects um, and then vets them with the um, AVP for community health and the treasury leader. Those recommendations then go to what we call our local impact investment committee, which is comprised of myself and our VP of finance. And we, um, as well as our treasury officer, the three of us act as that committee and if we like a project, again, you know, I'm really there to evaluate its alignment with our social determinants of health and community health improvement strategies. Uh, Stacy and Greg are there to evaluate the financial risk and um, ensure that it's vetted from that perspective. If we all agree, then it's recommended to our executive vice president and chief financial officer for approval. He's able to approve any investment up to $5 million. And we wanted this in place because we did not want our investment committee spending all of its time on impact investments. Bert says all the time, remember, this is 2% of their portfolio that they are managing. And we need them focused usually on the 98%. So we're only going to ask for their approval for an investment over $5 million and we'll report to them annually on the impact of this work. And Nick presents um, now to that, to the impact investment, or excuse me, the investment committee once a year. But there's this important advised component there on the right. The Local Impact in Investment Advisory Council has two members of the investment committee on it so that there's always two members who are in the know all the time about the investments we're considering. It's also populated by a few community members 
um, one from NeighborWorks, uh, a local nonprofit organization, and Josh Romney, uh, an individual who works in uh, real estate development in our communities. And these act as advisors to um, those who are on the local in investment committee regarding issues of um, governance even, but also our processes as we were developing them, and then specific projects and things we're interested in getting their viewpoint on. So this is how we uh, organize the work. I think we can bring down the slides now and uh, just open it up for your questions and discussion. We do have one or two in the chat, Mikkel. Oh, great. Um, so uh, Chuck, to, to answer your question a little bit deeper, um, we have one or two projects where we, well, just one now, maybe another one coming. We've tried to measure health outcomes a little bit more directly. Um, the, the one that we kind of started with a year and change ago was, you know, we, we designed a sort of health and well-being survey to be administered amongst residents every six months. Um, we've had some practical logistical challenges with just doing that, right, with getting sort of consistent responses and having really low response rates. We're working through some of that. Um, the next project that we're thinking about is uh, uh, affordable housing, you know, developer, owner, operator, um, uh, willing to share sort of enough resident information and get information releases so that we could, you know, take those names and, and see, you know, are they patients or, or members uh, of Inner Mountains and what does their health usage look like? We're working through the, the kind of mechanics of some of that. Um, obviously, there's a lot of privacy concerns, et cetera. Um, but the goal is ultimately to be able to actually measure the health outcomes. The challenge is that, you know, these things happen over a really long arc. Um, so we shouldn't expect to see dramatic health improvements in the first six months or a year. Um, you know, they, they would happen in much longer term. So we're trying to deepen that. Um, Another is uh, from Kevin, requirements for borrowers to apply for some of the down payment assistance products. So <clears throat> we're not doing down payment assistance products directly. We do them through intermediaries. Um, we're very intentional about staying out of the decision-making process about who kind of gets the you know, down payment assistance product ultimately. Um, but I will tell you that generally speaking, if, if you know, like with Rocky Mountain Homes Fund as an example, um, if, if you work in one of their sort of uh, uh, employment areas that they're interested in supporting teachers and healthcare, and you are within a certain income band, probably less than 80% AMI, um, that you qualify. And from then it's, you know, sort of just going through the, the application process. Um, and then from Katie, how would you compare the Intermountain model with social impact bond programs? Yeah. So, um, we, we don't have the sort of pay for performance aspect yet, at least, right? So um, we ask for reporting from our folks every year um, and we do both financial and impact. Um, and part of the intent of measuring that stuff is we kind of want to create some pressure, right? We want to, to folks to sort of be thinking about the impact and um, what, what gets measured tends to get managed. Um, so, you know, we don't have a, but there isn't, you know, some sort of like performance-based incentive there. I think that's the big difference. Um, that and, you know, relative to a, a true social impact bond, the, the, the government really isn't involved here, right? This is just Intermountain uh, op operating with other private players and, and trying to um, instigate some of this work. Uh, April has a great... Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I well, I was going to move on to the next question. I was. Um, okay. Yeah. So if April says, do you ever stack investments with grants in addition to impact investing? We have done that. Um, on the, the way that we kind of think about it is, um, you know, we like to use the impact investing for the sort of bricks and mortar um, for infrastructure type things. And we like to use the grants to support services that may be taking place, you know, within the bricks and mortar. We'd like to do more of that. I think there's opportunity to do more of that. Um, but yeah, we've, we've, I think we did our first kind of joint project about a year ago and we've done a handful since and I think they've been really great. Yeah, and, and interestingly, sometimes they start on the grant side and move 
with the investment coming later. Others have been investment first and then grant. Um, and kind of separate decision making processes, but um, but we like that additionality. It's uh, it's really effective. There's one other question there that I'll let you take, Nick. As part of job creation, as part of a job creation strategy, would you consider investing in a small business or CDFIs that work with low income entrepreneurs? And that's from Elena Vasquez. Thanks, Elena. Yeah, definitely. We're looking at two projects right now within the bounds of Utah. Um, that do exactly that. So one is, uh, there's an organization called the Utah Microloan Fund that we've been in a long conversation with to, to find a way to support them. Um, they do exactly what you're talking about. Um, and another uh, relationship that's a little bit less developed, but very similar work, right? Um, the, the sort of additionality argument there is these providers that we're working with both CDFIs, um, so they have to serve a low-income population, um, at least majority. Uh, and also they both provide products um, that are pretty scarce in the marketplace, right? So they're looking at very small businesses in some cases, in other cases, slightly larger, but the kind of common thread amongst their businesses is they're all unbankable, but just on the verge of being bankable. Um, so maybe, you know, maybe they just don't, for whatever reason, right? They don't have enough assets, they don't have cash flow, whatever. Um, so the both these groups kind of work to get their portfolio companies bankable in a couple of years. Um, so that's the kind of additionality argument there. Sorry, that was a little deeper than <laughs> you probably want. I'd like to oh, go ahead. Sorry, I see one from Dave there. Looking ahead to potential food insecurity investments, what components are you looking for as potential candidates? Nick, why don't you share the, the project that we keep hoping is going to happen? Um, yeah, yeah. So the challenge with food insecurity we found is that, you know, there's kind of a question of, okay, so what, so what do we do, right? Housing is easy. You need units, right? So yeah, we can do real estate loans, no problem. Um, the, ch the challenge with food insecurity is that, like, where we can add value is a little less clear. What we've talked about with one or two folks um, is kind of a... a a food hub concept. Um, so this kind of blends, um, you know, it'd be a kind of mixed use project is the idea, some affordable housing, um, some kind of community space and some food space, right? So that could be a fresh foods market, particularly in areas that are food deserts, boy, wouldn't that be a super valuable thing? Um, and it might also be more than that, right? It might be a, a test kitchen or a uh, food kind of processing node, right? Where growers, local growers could come sell and also process some of their food for, for repackaging and for sale, um, you know, either right there or wherever they're selling their cut squash or whatever the thing is. Um, the, the, we would love to do something like that. Part of the challenge of this work is, I mean, we can kind of go out there and say like, hey, you guys, what about this great idea? But we're not the developer, right? And we're not the city. So there's a lot of other partners who we kind of have to be um, patient with and, and also uh, aligned with to, to kind of make these things work. I have a question from Michelle. Serving as a loan guarantor, guaranteeing a line of credit with the bank, very beneficial for affordable housing, definitely. Yeah, can be structured in ways that doesn't require guarantor to tie up any of their money. Yeah, so we've thought about this too, Michelle. It's a really, really good question. Um, we, we walked away for an opportunity to do this right when we first started, because I think there was some hesitance to create a, a kind of conditional liability on our balance sheet. I think since then, our, the program has matured and our thinking has matured a little bit. I think, you know, this is definitely in bounds now. We're at the very early stages of a conversation around something like this for um, a, a, a affordable housing sort of concept here. Um, the challenge is for us getting it off the balance sheet, right? So it actually matters that we put money out there. <laughs> um, so even if it's like going and sitting in a guarantee pool somewhere, invested by somebody else, we make some of the return on, you know, however it's being invested, that works for us, but we have to get it off our balance sheet just because of kind of, you know, the, the uh, 
financial preferences, I guess. Oh, and Sarah has a question. How are you looking at this work and next steps with your new presence in Denver? Yeah, salient uh, question. So, um, you know, I think as with all new areas, we're, we're exp expanding this work into Nevada and Southern Idaho this year. So we've been all Utah until now. Um, we, we first want to be uh, really deliberate about making sure our kind of focus areas in terms of issues are meeting needs in the community, right? So we kind of start with a question around community needs. Um, the, the second conversation then is who are the other partners working in this space? And most of the, the these cases, uh, you know, like for affordable housing, we just aren't the experts, right? So we need really strong community partners who are already doing the work that we can support. Um, specifically, uh, you know, with Denver, I, I think um, it's, seems to me, you know, we would follow those two steps. One thing I'm excited about um, in, you know, Colorado and, and regionally is that there are more, there's a higher CDFI presence. Um, so that I think there's maybe a lot of opportunity there. Um, yeah, anything you would add to that, Mikhail? You know, I, I think you described it really well. Um, you know, we, we have a lot to work out in terms of merger integration before we get to this. Um, and yet we know that we, we, share a, uh, we share an interest in addressing the social determinants of health. So we'll look forward to uh, getting to know those opportunities and, and likely be getting to do this kind of work in that area. So we'll, we've already told Michelle, we're a little bit um, envious that you all have this group to convene and discuss these issues as a community. This is a first for us within our service area. Uh, we have we have other friends, but not a network such as this. So this is pretty special. And um, I hope I hope we have the opportunity to work with you as we as we grow together. That is a great parting word. So Mikkel, thank you. Nick and Mikkel, thank you so much. Um, we really, we welcome you to the Denver Anchor Network and are excited uh, to have you participate. I think you kicked off, a, I'm looking forward to the feedback we get from people in terms of potential next steps and, and what else do people want to learn about this to start to moving into action um, locally. So thank you so much. Thanks for everybody for being here and um, we'll see you soon, I hope. Thank you all. And Michelle, not that anybody is, is asking or is going to ask, but you you can share these slides if you'd like. Thank you. They did ask. Okay. <laughs> okay. I got some private chats. People are asking for that. Okay. And we have the recording, so we will make both available to people. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, all. Thank you. Bye. 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 Oh, thank you, Jessica. You want to stop recording? Oh, maybe. <laughs>